It's great to welcome to the program today Rutger Bregman, who is a historian and also author of Humankind, a hopeful history and the best selling utopia for realists. You may also recognize him from such viral moments as that time he said the thing about taxes at Davos and when Tucker Carlson flipped out on him and tried not to air it. Uh, Rutger, great to have you on. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, David. So to begin with a hopeful history, humankind, I'm interested in this because particularly right now, mm -hmm. there are many people who who maybe don't have the most optimistic perspective on humanity and and on homo sapiens. So mm -hmm. what what is your source of general optimism about mm -hmm. humanity? The book is really about a sort of silent revolution that has taken place in science within, I'd say, the last 15 to 20 years. So what has happened is that scientists from very diverse disciplines, uh, anthropologists, sociologists, uh, psychologists, you name it, have moved from maybe a little bit cynical view of human nature to a much more positive, hopeful view of human nature. So in the book, I'm just sort of describing this whole process and, and trying to point this out because what I discovered is that often these scientists don't even know it from each other, right? Uh, there was one psychologist who at one point during my research said to me, uh, when I told her about, you know, stuff that's happening in biology and she said, oh my God, it's happening there as well. So I just wanted to, to, to let people know that this is, has been going on and it may be a source for hope as well. How do you make the case that human beings are sort of fundamentally good to the extent that that's a, a, a kind of definable, actionable term? Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say that people are fundamentally good, right? We're, we're, we're clearly not angels. Yes. What I would say is that what you assume in other people is often what you get out of them, right? So if you assume that most people are selfish and you'll start designing your institutions around that idea, you know, your schools, your marketplaces, uh, everything you do in your society, then that's what you get out of people, right? So what you assume is what you get. I think this is actually the defining idea of what we call neoliberalism, right? Uh, which is basically people are selfish and deal with it and design everything around it. Um, I think it has sort of produced the kind of people that the theory presupposed, and I think we can turn it around. Um, and in the book, I try to give a lot of examples of, for example, schools or or uh, even organizations or even prisons uh, that work with this sort of different kind of view of human nature and then uh, get some pretty interesting results as well. Well, that's what's so interesting about it, which is, as you point out, if if you take an economic perspective, if mm -hmm. you believe people are fundamentally greedy, you mm -hmm. then design an economic system around that. And it has major implications that are difficult to undo, even if people aren't fundamentally greedy. Yeah. yeah. If you look at evolutionary psychology, if you look mm -hmm. at social, et cetera, it, every one of the systems we've designed is based around some of these core ideas. So the the, the implications are actually not just uh, a theoretical and trivial. No, they're, no, 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 it, they're very real. It's a quite revolutionary idea. So at first, at first, it may sound like, oh, this guy has written some nice, happy, clappy book about how human beings are friendly. No, actually, the implications are really revolutionary because, you know, if we cannot trust each other, then we need them, right, to keep us in check. Then we need the CEOs and the managers and the bankers and the monarchs and the generals and you name it. Then we need those in power. Then we need hierarchy. If actually most people are pretty decent, and can be trusted, then we can move to a radically different society, you know, that is much more egalitarian, uh, where people have the freedom to make their own choices. Suddenly all kinds of things become possible that initially were not possible at all. At what sort of level of focus do you think is the right one to make these observations about humanity? And I'll give you an example of, of what I mean. You could take, for example, the Kitty Genovese a mm -hmm. story of 1964 and the bystander effect mm -hmm. and use that to extrapolate about human nature. Or you could say, hey, you know what? Over time, war has become less and less common. You're right. These are very mm -hmm. different levels of focus, which mm -hmm. may get you to different conclusions about human nature. Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. do you think we should start evaluating what human nature is? Hmm. Well, I think you need to look at all these things. Um, in the book, I start with a very old theory within Western culture, which is the idea of veneer theory, right? Uh, and the idea goes like this. 
supposedly civilization is only a thin veneer. And as soon as something happens, say a war or a natural disaster or you shipwreck on an island, then supposedly people reveal their true selves. And, you know, they show that they're really animals and they're selfish. If you look, for example, at the news coverage of natural disasters, it's pretty much always like this. It's always veneer theory. You know, the, the news is full of stories about looting and violence and plunder, you know, kinds of whole kinds of horrible stories. But actually what sociologists have known basically since the 1960s is that what you get every single time after a natural disaster is an explosion of cooperation. People are really working together. A great example is uh, what happened after Katrina in the US. Uh, Rebecca Solnit has written a fantastic book about this, uh, A Paradise Built in Hell. But there are many other examples around the globe. It's, so it's really the opposite of veneer theory. But still, this theory is so deeply entrenched in our culture, you know, the idea that deep down we're all selfish. It goes back all the way to the ancient Greeks. You find it with the Christian church fathers, you know, the idea that we're all born as sinners. Even the Enlightenment philosophers, uh, David Hume, uh, Adam Smith. I think you could argue that the U.S. itself was sort of founded on the idea that people are selfish. If you read some of the texts of the founding fathers, uh, John Adams, for example, he wrote an essay that said all men would be tyrants if they could. Or James Madison, who said, you know, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. You know, let's let's be real. Let's assume that most people are selfish. So often when people say, oh, you got to be a realist, they say, well, don't be too idealistic, right? Otherwise, you're naive. And so I think that the, the, the larger pro project here is sort of to try and redefine what it means to be a realist, is that actually the realistic scientific position these days is to sort of conclude that actually human beings have evolved to cooperate. And um, there's actually this process in our evolutionary history that biologists call survival of the friendliest, uh, which is very much the opposite of what I have, had always thought. What uh, role in this analysis does the idea of a sort of multi-layer evolutionary selection have to play? The idea that an individual being greedy within a group that cooperates may may be a more relevant way to look than simply humans are individually greedy or not greedy. Well, there are certainly different theories right now within biology, right? Whether you should look at evolution on the individual level or on the group level. And there, there's a lot of scientific debate going on there. And to be honest, I don't really have a big preferred position here. I think sort of the more important takeaway of, you know, developments within biology of the past couple of years, say 15 to 20 years, is that actually uh, biologists have discovered this process of what they call survival of the friendliest, right? So for thousands of years, it was actually the friendliest among us who had the most kids. You know, imagine Donald Trump in prehistory. It's an impossibility. You know, he wouldn't have survived for long. People wouldn't have liked him, wouldn't want to cooperate with him, would have expelled him from the group and probably would have died alone, right? Or if he was really nasty, he would have been executed by the group. So uh, we know this from, you know, studies from nomadic hunter-gatherer tribes around the globe that being friendly, being humble was really a prerequisite if you wanted to survive. Now, it's only recently in this era that we call sort of the civilized era that everything has changed. And nowadays, you know, there seems to be this process that we call you know, survival of the shameless, right? Where so often, if you are shameless, that can actually be an advantage, which is, I think, highly unnatural for us as a species. Because, you know, one of the most fascinating things that I discovered during my research is that human beings are actually the only species in the animal kingdom that blush, you know? which is a fascinating fact that we blush. And uh, for thousands of years, it, it was an evolutionary advantage for us because it helped us to cooperate. And I think we need to go back to that vision of human nature. So I want to ask about what your vision of human nature would imply. Maybe the economic system should be. But before we get to that, the veneer theory, mm -hmm. is it too early to see if or how that applies to the world reaction to coronavirus? Or, or do you have some sense of if and how that applies to, to how we're, we're currently seeing the world react to that pandemic? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, at first, there were some stories or quite a lot of stories in the press about people hoarding toilet paper and, you know, why even fighting over toilet paper. And again, it was very tempting to conclude that, oh, here we have a crisis. People are selfish once again. 
I think by now we can zoom out and, and say that actually the vast majority of most people has actually been pro-social in nature. Most people are actually helping each other. There's quite some evidence accumulating now from different countries is that, you know, it mostly brings out the positive, the, the good in, in, in people. You know, there's been so many initiatives from the bottom up, you know, groups on WhatsApp and on Facebook and neighbors helping each other, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all not very surprising to sociologists because, as I said, you know, they've known for a very long time that most people pull together uh, during a time of crisis. It's not it's not what the Hollywood movies have taught you. You know, it's not like panic and everyone going nuts and crazy, blah, blah, blah. It's very much the opposite. Uh, you know, one of the most striking eyewitness accounts that I uh, discovered during my research was, for example, how some people behave during 9-11, you know, when they were going down the stairs of the twin tower, twin towers as they were burning, and people were literally saying, "No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go. <laughs> this is crazy." But it actually happened. So you talked about how seeing human nature as fundamentally greedy implies, or maybe justifies, the neoliberal economic framework, which is very interesting. If mm -hmm. someone were to accept your fundamental view of human nature, what is the economic system that would logically follow from that? Hmm. Well, you could do a lot of things. Uh, actually, I started writing this book because I had first written a book about the idea of giving everyone a guaranteed basic income, right? So my, the, this was Utopia for Realists. And the book was full of studies and examples and experiments that show that this could actually work. People in general have sort of two objections against the idea and they say, well, it doesn't work because, you know, people are lazy and they'll stop working. Or they'll say, you can't do it because people will waste the money. You know, they'll just spend it on drugs or alcohol. Those are like the two most common objections. And so I, I sort of tried to collect all this evidence and say, you know, it actually does work. We have tried it and the, the science says it works. Um, so I went on a book tour in a couple of countries. And again and again and again, I found myself discussing human nature with people. Because so, so often people would say, yeah, okay, maybe this works on a local level. Maybe this works in this particular experiment here or there in Canada or in the US in the 70s, but that was a very different place, highly exceptional. In the end, you just got to look at human nature and be realistic. So I started to understand that for so many of the exciting ideas that I cared about, and not only basic income, but also, for example, different ways to do democracy, you know, participatory democracy, they all presupposed a different view, a more hopeful view of human nature. And then I realized that actually I didn't have that view myself. You know, I uh, had studied history. I had, you know, studied so many of these sort of cynical experiments from the 60s, the Stanford prison experiment or the Milgram experiment that many people will know with the shock machine. Um, so I started basically on a journey with it, basically to see if I, if I could actually realistically adopt a more hopeful view of human nature. And that resulted in this book. And is there a specific I mean, from the point of view of the, the vast majority of, of so-called Western democracies are is there low hanging fruit or so-called specific policies that would be the ones that most obviously could be changed for the betterment of society on the basis of your newfound optimism? Oh, um, well, maybe it's interesting to zoom in on prisons, mm. uh, which is one of the most radical applications of, of this theory of human nature. Um, if you go to Norway, you'll find prisons that are really, really weird and strange, where they really treat inmates as if they're actually people. So there are prisons like Bastoy or Halden, very close to Oslo, where you'll find, you know, people who have been convicted of murders or rapes or pretty horrible things, but still get the freedom, um, you know, to read books. There's a cinema, there's even a music studio. They have their own music label that is called Criminal Records. Um, and, and you would even, you, you know, some people would say, well, this is like some kind of holiday resort. Uh, but then you look at the science behind it, right? You look at the statistics and, and in particular, you look at the recidivism rate and you realize that actually Norway has the lowest recidivism rate in the world. So the chance that someone will commit another crime, you know, after he or she gets out of prison, that's the recidivism rate is nowhere as low as in Norway. So these prisons work, even though they don't really look like prisons, they're highly, highly effective. Then you look at prisons in the US, 
and you realize that actually these prisons have, have the highest recidivism rate in the world, right? If you treat people like crap, there will be crap. <laughs> I mean, I can't make it easier than that. If you treat people like people, they will behave like people. Um, this, in the case of prisons, it really goes against your intuition, right? You really sort of, uh, the intuition says vengeance, you know, people who've done these horrible things, you want vengeance, you want to lock them up, you want them to suffer. Um, but if you um, realistically look at what works, then I think Norway really leads the way here. Yeah, it's also counterintuitive. One, one might imagine you want prison to be really bad so people are more incentivized to avoid going back. And it just does not mm -hmm. seem to actually function, function in that way. Obviously. And the other problem is that prisons can become sort of universities for crime. So this is really the case in the US. People people come in maybe for small, minor offenses, drug offenses or something like that, and then they become hardened criminals in the prison system, right? I for the book I looked at the history of the of of the system in the US and it's it's really astonishing to find out that actually in the early 70s um you know, the US experimented with Norway style uh prisons, you know, and it worked really well. Uh, it's just that after that, history took a different direction. Same is true for basic income, by the way. The US almost implemented a guaranteed basic income under Nixon. <laughs> you know, there's no country that came as close to implementing a basic income as the US. Uh, but that didn't happen in the end. No, uh, it didn't. Because of a, a lot of bizarre coincidences. Yeah, even, I mean, between <laughs> World War One and Two, there was a moment where the direction for healthcare in the United States was going towards universal health care, but it was deemed to be too much like what was happening in Germany at the time. And for mm. political reasons, it, it was not pursued as we, of course, uh, of course, now know. We've been yeah. speaking with Rutger Bregman, historian, author of Humankind, A Hopeful History, and of course, author of the best-selling Utopia for Realists, I so appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you.